to 
telling me? Christmas Eve on after this service, I felt like I could breathe. And um, I've enjoyed the last several days just being downtime and watching my kids, you know, just play with all their toys and the delight that's been on their face. And um, as I thought about this morning and our time of worship together, um, yeah, they, they made me smile a lot just watching them and um, watching them have so much and uh, not just material possessions but we have each other and maybe you experience that too just kind of taking a deep breath and looking around and and being thankful for your family and for all you have and this morning as we just have one more song and then we get to hear from scripture uh, we're going to hear a powerful scripture today um, would you just take a deep breath and be thankful for all you have, but chiefly what you have is this relationship with God that never perishes or spoils or fades. You, you can take a deep breath and smile because he, like we sang about in that first song, never fails. And he's never going to let go of you. And um, this, song, this next song says, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And you probably know it because it's an old hymn, but... Would you just let your heart feel so full and so thankful for all you have? Um, and and as, I, as we've smiled at our kids and we've smiled at one another, would you take some time to smile at God and just praise Him and thank Him for all you've got? Thank you. 
wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live and love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Sing it with us. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we recognize, especially at this time of the year, just how incredibly blessed we are. And it is right for us, after having spent the last month preparing for and celebrating the birth of your Son, it is, it's right for us to celebrate. And it's right for us to feel blessed and to recognize your grace and your goodness and your mercy and, and just the gift of Christmas. It is right for us to feel that way. But God, as we now approach a new year, it is also right for us to respond to You, to react to You and to this incredible gift that's been given. God, there should be a difference in the way that we live our life. There should be a difference in our priorities. There should be a difference in how we act and the way we think and the things that we say. But most of all, God, in what we do. And I pray that this morning that You would just challenge us. Give us... Give us a, a word that might resound in our heart and give us a direction that we may take steps in your direction and that we may try to follow after you and be what you have called us to be. Father, we love you. We look forward to this time with you and with your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Amen. Now, it's good to see you this morning. Let me ask you, if you would, to go ahead and, and take out your message notes from inside your program. And then also, if you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to find Philippians chapter 3, uh, which is in the New Testament. Uh, go to the Gospels and turn right. Eventually you're going to come to Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to be. And, and let me just, let me, as you're looking for that, let me start by saying that I hope that you had a great, great Christmas. I've, I've asked a bunch of people and the consensus seems to be that it was pretty good. And I hope it was everything that you were expecting like we talked about last week and over these past few weeks. And now that Christmas is over, I want to challenge you to turn your attention to New Year's, which is coming up, is it uh, Tuesday night, right? And, and let me ask you this, how many of you, how many of you made New Year's resolutions last year? If, if, you, if you think you did that last year, raise your hand. Oh good, nobody? One, two, uh, what, what, you're embarrassed? You're like, like this? Okay, just come on. I, I made a resolution last year, it's okay, alright, good. How many expect to make a resolution this year? Oh, okay, well, a, a bunch of us. Uh, how many of you expect to make a resolution on Tuesday night and then break it by next Sunday? Anybody in that category? That's why you were embarrassed to raise your hand, right? Well, this morning as we prepare to begin a new year, I want to show you a famous resolution of sorts made by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, verses 10 through 17. Now, this didn't actually have anything to do with a new year, but it was a resolution that Paul made to himself, and he made it in his relationship with his Heavenly Father. He begins by saying this. This is verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. 
I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or the other I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling. Verse 15, Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. You know, every year people make New Year's resolutions. But they learn very quickly how hard those resolutions can be to keep. In fact, one survey revealed that 70% of all New Year's resolutions are broken in the first seven days of January. Now the reality is a lot of time we make resolutions on January 1st, but we just don't seem to be able to sustain them for the duration of the year. In fact, my daughter and I had a conversation this week. We were talking about resolutions, and she said, I am not, I, I will not, I am not going to drink uh, pop. Who all calls it pop and who calls it soda? Pop. Pop. All right, well, I'm not going to drink pop. Pop's the sound. Pops is saying, okay, that's from our Yankees from the north. That's fine. That's fine. No one listens to that. But here, here, here's the deal. She says, I will not, I am not, I shall not drink pop uh, in 2014. Until <laughs> May. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that last part? She said, un, un, until May. <laughs> until May. Oh, okay, so you're starting the resolution. You don't even tend to keep it through five months of the year. And that's kind of how it is for a lot of us. And, and, and you know, here's the deal. That's kind of a shame because every one of us have things in our lives that probably need to change, don't we? And if you think about it, most of the time, New Year's resolutions are nothing more than sort of half-hearted acknowledgement of things that we need to improve in our lives. That's really all they are. But they're not approached with any real sense of determination or any real sense of commitment. In fact, sometimes I think we're almost relieved when they're broken because it means that we can stop worrying about them for another year, right? If I break that resolution not to drink pop by about April, then i got the rest of the year to kind of enjoy pop, and, and that works for me, and it probably works for you as well. Now, with all of that said, I still think New Year's resolutions can be a good idea. In fact, I'd like to ask you to take a moment right now. Are you ready for this? I want to ask you to write down a New Year's resolution. We gave you a green card when you came in this morning. looks like this. It says, My New Year's resolution. What? Why? How? Here's what I want you to do. Just take a minute. Take 30 seconds. And we're right next to where it says what, I want you to write down a resolution. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it right now. You're looking at me kind of funny, but go ahead. Now maybe this is your promise that, you're, that you made to God for Christmas, or maybe this is what you're going to commit to on New Year's Eve, or, or maybe you haven't thought about it very much, but you can think of something real quick just to give us a place to start this morning. Okay? Can you do that? All right, now, as, as we look at our resolution, if you're not done, keep writing, you're fine. But as we look at the resolution, we need to be aware of the areas in our life that need improvement. And we need to put forth the effort to make those areas better. But the first thing we have to understand about resolutions is that change isn't as simple as acknowledging the need for change, no matter what Dr. Phil says, okay? It, it's, there's more to it than that. If you really want to change your life, it requires commitment. It requires persistence. It requires determination. And, listen to me, this is the most important part, it requires an ever-improving relationship with God. Do you guys agree with that? That is what is required for change to take place in our life. This morning we're beginning a new series called Change Me. And my goal is to give you the most practical messages I can possibly give you over these next three weeks that, that maybe can help you get started and create 
creating some long-term change in your life. For the next three weeks, we're going to focus on three biblical principles that are absolutely essential for improving your happiness, your healthiness, and most important of all, your effectiveness as a follower of God in the coming year, 2014. Today we're going to talk about the principle of perspective. All right, Perspective. Now one of the main things that affects who we are and how we live more than anything else in our life is the way that we think. It's our attitude. It's our perspective. Norman Vincent Peale said, change your thoughts and you change your world. And I think he got that idea from the Apostle Paul who said this in Romans 12 too, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, the first step to creating change in your life is to change the way you think. But, I want to make this clear, it's the first step. It's not the only step. You cannot just positive think your way to success. Because there is a difference between positive thinking and wishful thinking, right? In fact, I don't even like the term positive thinking. There's a better term we can use. Instead of tri striving to become a positive thinker, I believe we should strive to become action-oriented thinkers. That is what we need to strive to be. You see, as Christians, we need to learn to think of ourselves and our circumstances in ways that motivate us to take action, to actually do something, to accomplish something for our Heavenly Father. Think of it this way. There's an old saying that if you have an 8-ounce glass with 4 ounces of water in it, a negative person, a pessimist, will say the glass is half empty, right? And the positive person or an optimist will say that the glass is half empty. Full. Now, how many of you are optimists? Raise your hands. I want everybody to vote here. Okay, I'm always amazed. I'm always, okay, good. And how many of you are, are pessimists? Go ahead. Pessimists don't tend to want to admit it as much, but there you are. And how many of you are pessimists who prefer to be, re to be referred to as realists? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. Right? Right, right. But see, here's the deal. The positive thinkers, optimists, they see it one way. The glass is half full. Negative thinkers see it another way. The glass is half empty. But the action-oriented thinker, which is what we want to become, will see the 8-ounce glass with 4 ounces of water in it and say, looks like I need some more water, right? I, it looks like I need some more water. Do you see the difference between the two things? Now, if you need more water, you're not going to think your way to a full glass, right? You have to actually physically take your glass to the faucet. Action-oriented thinking helps you do that. Now, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul epitomized action-oriented thinking. When you read his writings in the New Testament, you see that he was a man of great faith. He was an optimist. He was a positive thinker. But most of all, he was a man of action. In other words, he didn't just talk about the way things ought to be. He took action on them. And it's no wonder he experienced such dramatic change in his life. Think about this. After Paul surrendered to his life to Christ on the road to Damascus, he went from being violent intolerant, self-serving, and self-righteous to becoming a humble, holy, fully committed follower of Christ. And in Philippians chapter 3, one of the most famous passages of Scripture that Paul wrote, we see how he was able to create that lasting change in his own life. So, if you'll follow along with me in your notes, I want to show you three adjustments that need to be made in our way of thinking if we want to become action-oriented thinkers in 2014. First of all, action-oriented thinkers focus on long-term goals not just short-term resolutions. Long-term goals, not just short-term resolutions. Now both are important, but if you really want to create lasting change in your life, you have to develop a sense of the big picture. That's called perspective, by the way. You've got to be able to see the whole thing. You have to see your life in terms of goals and what you're accomplishing over the long haul rather than just temporary resolutions. Here's an example of how it applies in our life. Let's say that a guy decides to give up smoking because he knows it's not good for his health. And he quits. But to compensate for his overwhelming urge for nicotine, he begins to eat everything in sight. Okay, So six months later, he's a non-smoker, 
but he's gained 50 pounds. He's exchanged one health problem for another health problem. Is any of this sounding familiar to anybody, right? He's traded smoking for gluttony, and both are bad for you. Now, a lot of times people end up thinking, well, look, I'd rather smoke than be overweight, so they just go back to their old habit they had. And, and listen, that is resolution-oriented change. Now, on the other hand, a goal-oriented person realizes that his real objective in giving up a, a, a cigarette is to improve his health. So he finds other ways to deal with his cravings for nicotine. Uh, maybe, maybe he'll work out more often and exercise. If he finds that he's hungry all the time, he's going to make some healthier food choices so that he's not as likely to put on more weight. See, the resolution to give up smoking is good, but you've got to see it in terms of the big picture. So when you take a look at your New Year's resolution, whatever it is that you wrote down next to what on your card, ask yourself the question, what is the ultimate goal behind that resolution? What am I really trying to accomplish with what I wrote down there? What, what do I want or, or why do I want to make this change in my life? Then you let that goal become the focus of the action that you're going to take. Maybe there's a certain sin in your life that you'd like to get rid of. Here's the deal. You've got to ask yourself why. Why do I want to eliminate that sin? Because it's embarrassing? Because it's inconvenient? Because it's expensive? because my spouse nags me about it? Or is it because I want to please God? I want to be like Jesus. And by the way, which motivation do you think really is going to help you change? If you want to please God. You see, our long-term goals answer the question, why? Why do I want to do this? And they help keep us focused on the right reason for improving our lives and our relationship with Him. Now Paul's long-term goal is very simple. He says this, listen in verse 10. He says, I want, I resolve, I want to know Christ and, the, and to experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. It was for this cause, he said, verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You see, Paul struggled towards holiness in his life, not so that he could impress other people, not so that he could feel good about himself. He did it so that he could be like Christ, so that he could experience the power of Christ in his life. Now, let me ask you, have you ever met someone who seems to be very good, very ethical, very moral, but they have zero interest in spiritual things? Well, think about this. They're missing the whole point of being good. It's not about being able to pat ourselves on the back or, or being able to look at ourselves in the mirror. It's definitely not about being good enough to get ourselves into heaven because the Bible makes it clear that even our best isn't good enough for that, right? Pursuing holiness is about living a life that is pleasing to God. That's what it's all about. That's the whole point. So when you make a resolution, it's very important that you ask yourself, why is this important to me? Why do I care about this? Why do I want to do this? So right now, I want you to do that. I want you to take a look at your resolution, what you wrote next to what, and then I want you to answer the question, why? Why do I want to do this? Why is it important for me to change this or improve in this area? Go ahead and, and write it down. And maybe you might write down a couple of things. Go ahead and do that right now. Why do I want to make this change? Why is this important to me? And see, if you can answer the question, why, then that becomes the focus of your efforts at change. If we want to experience long-lasting God-honoring change in 2014. We have to learn to focus on long-term goals, not just short-term resolutions. The second thing that action-oriented thinkers focus on, and I want you to write this down, is progress, not just perfection. Progress, not just perfection. Now, obviously, holiness is the objective of a Christian life, and perfection is the objective of any New Year's resolution. If you want to stop yelling at the kids, you want to stop yelling at them 100% of the time, not just 50% of the time, right? You, you do want to do that, right? 
Okay? Uh, if you want to start walking a mile every day, you want to do it every day, not just once or twice a month. Perfection is the goal, but we have to learn to measure our progress because very few goals are accomplished overnight. More often than not, creating lasting change in your life is going to take time, right? It's going to take time. We know that. Paul recognizes that changes don't always take place overnight. But he also knew that the fact that it takes time and that it doesn't happen overnight, that's not a, a good reason to give up. He says this in verses 12 and 13. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, talking about what he wanted to do, or that I've already reached perfection. I haven't. He says, I haven't gotten there yet, but I press on. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now, what, what's he saying? He's saying, day by day, I keep moving forward. I keep gro going. I keep growing. I keep changing. I may not be perfect now, but I keep pressing on towards the mark, trying to become as perfect in my relationship with God as I possibly can. And then however, fall, however far I fall short, I know God will make up the difference in the end. All right, think of, it, think of it like this. Kevin Durant of the Oklahoma City Thunder has been the NBA scoring champion three out of the last four years, okay? His goal, if you think about his resolve, his resolution, when he goes on the court, his goal is what? It is to score every single time he puts up a shot, right? Every time he shoots the ball, he wants to score. Obviously, he never takes a shot with the attitude, maybe I should miss this time. Right? If you know anything about Kevin Durant, you know that is not going to happen. His goal is absolute, 100% perfection, to score every time he shoots. But no basketball player has ever achieved that, have they? Not KD, not Michael Jordan, nobody. So does that mean that KD quits trying if he misses a shot? Oh, well, I missed a shot in the second quarter. There's no point in trying another one, right? No, he's, he's never going to say that. As he works towards the goal of hitting every shot, he measures his success by the progress that he makes. Is, is he scoring more points per game? Is he hitting a higher percentage of shots than before? His focus is on progress, not just perfection, even though perfection is the goal that he's trying to reach. Action-oriented thinkers are the same way. They focus on long-term goals, not just short-term resolutions. They focus on progress, not just perfection. And then finally, here's the last one. Action-oriented thinkers focus on the how, not just the what. The how, not just the what. And, and I, I save this one for last because I, I think maybe this is the most important part. See, most of the time, the what is the easy part. We know what we want. We just don't always know how to get there, do we? It's easy to say, I want to be a great parent. Knowing exactly how to pull that off isn't always so easy. It's easy to say, I want to have a great marriage. Knowing how to have a happy marriage is not always easy. The how-to part requires some thought. You've got to develop a strategy from getting from where you are to where you need to be. Just setting a goal, just making a New Year's resolution, that's not going to change your life. You have to, to have a map, in a sense, for getting to where you want to be. Now, let's say your goal is to develop a better relationship with your children. And I think that's a, a really good goal. No doubt that's something that would be pleasing to God, correct? If we could do that, I'm going to improve my relationship with my kids in 2014. I, I think that's great. But you've got to have a strategy for making that happen. You can't just, you know, you know, just bear down and, and just grit your teeth and, and make a better relationship with your kids. That's not how it works. You've got to have a strategy. Now, a positive thinker says, I, I just know I can be a great parent, right? I just, I just know I can do it. A resolution setter says, I resolve to be a great parent and resolving is half the battle. Amen? Right? That, that's it. That's halfway there. I've already resolved, so that's good. Negative thinker says, hey, I'm never going to be a great parent, so what's the point of trying? Don't, don't raise your hand if, that, if that's your approach. Now, these are all approaches to a goal. 
But are they going to be effective in accomplishing anything? Those three things. Are they going to accomplish anything? What I'm suggesting is that our relationship with God demands that we approach the goal with a plan of action. We have to have a plan of action. Okay, so here's what you might say. You say, well, you know, time with my children is important to me. I know that that's a big part of my relationship with them. So I want to spend at least three more hours a week with my kids. Okay, so I'm going to start by spending an hour alone with each of, of my children. If you've got one, that's, there you go. you got an hour with them. If you've got two, you're going to spend some more time with them. Doing something that they love to do. Now, right now in my family, uh, you know, my 15-year-old my is learning to drive, so Lord Jesus, I'm going to spend some time with her doing that. <clears throat> That's going to be good for our relationship, maybe. And then uh, my son, my 12-year-old, you are 12, right? 12-year-old, uh, he's pretty much, it's pretty much Xbox all the time with him, so, you know, maybe I could spend some time hanging out and, and doing the Xbox thing with him a little bit. Then um, maybe I could, uh, you know, if I'm going to try to spend some more time with him, I could help him with, with the chore that they do. My kids have to take out the trash. My kids have to uh, empty the dishwasher. So maybe instead of, as I love to do, saying, hey, Go empty the dishwasher. I mean, that's why I had kids in the first place, right? <laughs> that's the whole point. Maybe instead of saying that, I say, hey, let's empty the dishwasher together. I'm rethinking this at the moment. Just give me one second. I'm thinking, is this really a good idea? I don't even know. But, but may, that would, let's just say this is all you know, theoretical. How about that? This is just all theoretical. So I could, do, I could do some of that. And that would give us a chance maybe even to talk a little bit, but just to be together while we work. And, and then maybe you say, well, I know what I could do. I could spend some time each, each day in prayer with my kids, maybe before they go to school in the morning or, or at the end of the day when they're getting ready to go to bed. I could do that. And that, you know, that would be some really good time that I could spend with my kids. And then just to really make an investment. We're going to participate together at church. We're going to come to church together. We're going to do things together. We're going to serve together. I want them to see me learning how to love God and, and love other people and, and how to grow in my relationship with God and how to serve other people. Because I know that the best way to make sure they develop a relationship with God is for them to see me developing a relationship with my Heavenly Father, right? Now, let me ask you, do you see or do you think there's a difference between all of that and just saying, boy, I'd sure like to be a better parent Right? That's what we do on New Year's, isn't it? Boy, I'd sure like to be a better parent. But the more specific your map is, the better. Goals, resolutions, dreams, and desires, they're all meaningless unless they're powered by strategies to bring about their accomplishment. So let me encourage you. Seek God's direction for those strategies. Let God lead you. Let God show you. What specific things can take place so that you can become a better parent? Or whatever it is that your resolution might be. Now, Paul gives the Philippians a strategy for reaching the goal of godliness. First, he says in verse 16, listen to this. He says, but we must hold on to the progress we've already made. The NIV says it this way. Let's live up to what we have already attained. Then he goes on in verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Paul is saying, if you want to be like Christ, then here's how to get there. Live the truth you already know and follow the example set by me and by other spiritual leaders. He's saying to support the what and the why with a how-to. Because unless you develop the how, the what is always going to be an unattainable goal. So you know what? Let's take a moment. Let's take a moment with our card and let's map out a little bit of how for your resolution. Why don't you just very quickly write down three or four things that would help you accomplish the what. And, and, and factor in the why. Why do I want this? Why am I doing this? Okay. How? How might I do this thing that I am resolving to do. Take a couple of seconds there and, and write that down. You guys, some of you have heard me talk about before one of the really important things for me whenever I'm working on a message to present to you is that I always go back through my notes. You know, I have several different drafts of what I'm writing and I always go back in with a pencil and I circle stuff that I've said that I, that I believe you should do this 
I, God says do this. God's Word says to do this. I believe this is important for you to do. And I always circle that, and then I write YBH, and I circle that next to it. Anybody remember what YBH stands for? Yes, but how, right? Yes, but how? Okay, yes, you should do this. Yes, but how? How do you do it? And, and here's the thing. The reason that I try to always be focused on that especially when I'm suggesting that you need to do something, is that that's a reminder to me that I have a great responsibility when I stand before you and I open God's Word to you, I have a responsibility to tell you not only what you should do, but how you can do it. Action-oriented thinkers focus on the how, not just the what. And it's also why they depend so much on the Bible for guidance. See, the Bible doesn't leave us hanging. It teaches us how to do what God wants us to do. That's the most incredible thing about the Bible. So, if you want to create lasting changes in your life, if you want this year, 2014, to be different, you've got to change the way you think. You've got to focus on long-term goals, not just short-term resolutions. You've got to focus on progress, not just perfection. You've got to focus on the how, not just the what. See, it's not about thinking positively or negatively. It's about thinking in terms of action. You don't say the glass is half empty. Don't worry about the glass is half full. You say, I need more water. Now, how do I go about getting it? How do I go about filling it up? And believe me, when you make a commitment to become an action-oriented thinker, and your focus is on your Heavenly Father and your relationship with Him, I promise you, God will guide you through the process. He'll help you establish goals that glorify Him. He'll give you the wisdom to know what you need to do and how you need to do it, and He'll give you the strength to make progress along the way. Not perfection, but He's going to give you the strength you need to progress as you go. Don't forget, don't forget, our God is a God of action. When He looked down on the earth and He saw that humans had messed up our lives and our relationship with Him, with our sin, He didn't just say, well, I sure hope they get things figured out. Or, or I resolve to help those humans. No. Instead, He made a plan of action. You remember what it was? He said, I will send my own Son to earth to live and then to die on the cross in their place so that they can once again be right with me and have eternal life when they die. And then He set that plan into motion. And He gave us the gift of salvation. And He left the choice up to us. From the very beginning, He's always been a God of action. So we need to be people of action as well. That's what, you know what, that's what our commitment time is all about. That's why we have a time at the end of the message to reflect on, to think about, to respond to the challenges given to us. Not just saying we want to be a Christian, but doing something about it by making a commitment to Him. Not just saying we want to be a part of, of His church, but doing something about it. We make commitments and covenants with God and His people. Not just saying we want to make godly changes in our life for a new year but doing something about it. Well, guess what? Now is your opportunity to do something about it. Let me ask you to bow your heads. Let's prepare our heart, our hearts as God speaks to us, as we reflect on what He's already said and what He's shown us in His Word, so that we can be as obedient to Him as we possibly can be. With heads bowed, let me just encourage you to, to pray right now. Heavenly Father, as we think about our, our New Year's resolution, maybe this is something we've had a lot of time to think about, or maybe this is something we just kind of scratched something out real fast because we hadn't thought about it much, and that's okay. But God, if, if we would seek You and ask You to show us what You want, the kind of change You want to see in our life, in our habits, in our discipline, in our relationships with other people and with You, God, if we wanted to glorify You in that, I just cannot believe that You would not show us what You want us to do. I can't believe that. And if, God, You would show us what You want us to do, I believe it is very important that we come to an understanding of why. And that somewhere in that why has got to be You, God. 
You have to be there for every area, every arena of our life. You've got to be part of the motivation. Sometimes all of the motivation. And then God, if you would show us what, and if you would show us why, I have to believe, based on your word, I have to believe you would show us how. And if you would show us how, the Apostle Paul promises me that you will give me the strength to do it. I won't be perfect. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But if I'm committed and faithful to you, you'll be committed and faithful to me. And I can accomplish the change that you've given me to make. God, maybe for some of us here, the change that needs to be make, made is, is for us to surrender our heart to you. Maybe for the very first time in our life to let you be in charge of us and for you to be our God, for us to accept Jesus as our Savior. That's the most important change that could ever take place in 2014. God, for those of us who are Christians, may we honestly and sincerely and passionately seek you today. And let this year be a year where we started and finished strong by being focused on you. This is my prayer. and We pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a moment. You guys are going to stand. We're going to sing and worship. I'll be here at the front if you need someone to pray with. Or maybe there's a, a commitment. Go ahead and stand if there's a commitment that you feel needs to be made, either shared with me or shared with our church. You're welcome to come at this time. Most of all, let's focus in on our Heavenly Father, what He wants to say to us and how we can respond to Him. Lord, I want to live my life to please You. I bring my heart before you to remold To make of me a vessel fit for honor That I might shine for you as sparkling gold To be pleased This is all I really want to do, is to be pleasing you, pleasing you. Lord, this is all I really want to do. Do you guys know this song? Have you ever heard it? No? then this is your song. You're not here by accident today. You're here because God wanted to make this song real in your heart and in your life. So let's sing it to Him. Let's sing it to Him. Lord, I want to live my life to please You. I bring my heart before You to remote to make of me a vessel fit for honor that I might shine for you as sparkling That's all this is. It's saying, God, I want to know what you want for me so that I know what I want for me, right? And when I know what you want, I know I can be I can be pleasing to you. Short term, long term, lifetime. I want to be obedient and I want to be pleasing to you. Let's finish up. Lord, I want to live my life to please.
please you I bring my heart before you to Happy New Year. Have a wonderful week.